talk about uh, outpatient pneumonia. It's still um, one of the commonest reasons why people get um, hospitalized. It's still a common cause of death. Um, there are all sorts of guidelines. I can tell you this, that if you look at the guidelines therapy for better outcomes, what we find is that um, all the therapies work pretty well. I'm going to talk about some studies that actually have a focus on better outcomes, which we all like, and how we recognize this. Now, <clears throat> this is a very common illness in my practice. If I'd see about 20 people a day in the office, not counting a bunch in the hospital, I'd probably see five cases of pneumonia uh, uh, a week. It's much more common than, than people think. And uh, it um, basically has, uh, there, there are social things that will help us guide uh, who gets what. So that uh, in young, healthy people, you're going to see common illness. In old, crummy people like I see uh, in St. Petersburg, uh, you get a little more problems. In nursing homes, you get a lot different problems. But we're going to talk about community-acquired pneumonia now because every place you go, there's a different cadre, if you will, of people that have this process. So <clears throat> what, we, what we do not get in medical school is anything about the sensible approach to pneumonia. But 95% of the time, it's an aspirational illness. And that means that the side you sleep on will be the side that has the pneumonia. When I was a, a resident, uh, Dr. John Hickam, my, uh, who was the magna cum laude from Harvard and the smartest man in the world by testing in internal medicine, had us all drink six ounces of barium. There's 30 of us. He said, I want you guys and a couple girls to go to the x-ray department and we're going to get x-rays. And guess what? Every one of us had barium in our lungs nocturnal aspiration. So the major problem with aspiration is it's going to be nocturnal. Number two is because we tend to sleep on one side or the other, it's going to be unilateral and it will be the side you sleep on. And by the way, when you look at sinusitis, uh, which is a common source uh, since it sits at the top of the airway, the side that you sleep on will also have the sinusitis. And so um, it's a real tell here. Now, the other thing is that you will get a call from somebody that says, this x-ray looks like pneumonia, and the guy's in there swinging his keychain, and the girl's out there smoking a cigarette looking pretty good. That's, you got scars on an x-ray. That's not necessarily pneumonia. Pneumonia is a toxic illness. You're going to feel like 10 pounds of poo in a 5-pound bag. And many times when I walk in the exam room, the patient it's like they're going to slide off onto the floor. It's the slide off the floor and out the door that really tells you it's toxic. And some of the toxicity uh, is going to be cough, fever, sputum production, uh, erythema or heat over the sinuses, which is commonly the origin. And, and, they, and sometimes they will have pain on the side of the pneumonia, especially when they take a deep breath. But it, people really feel lousy. In the nursing home population or in the elderly, sometimes they only get mental status change as the whole manifestation. They may not have fever. They may not have cough. They really don't, they don't have the same tells that, uh, that middle-aged people have. And so uh, the, the, if you get an elderly guy, that's what's really what's going on. Now. Um, since most pneumonia is not cough transmissible, we always look for the source of the aspiration. This leads to unilateral disease most of the time. And so we look at the sinuses, the teeth and gums, the GI tract, any neurologic disease, most people die from, from aspiration pneumonia. And we've all seen these things. We lose the syncytial effort that coordinates swallowing, and therefore the lung ends up right in the middle of it, getting aspirated on a common basis. And yet we've already said that uh, in my example of being a resident, <laughs> that every one of us had barium in our lungs uh, when we woke up in the morning and then, uh, and then went down for x-rays. It's a very telling sort of thing for uh, me. I can still remember it. 
So this is really a, a uh, uh, this comes from uh, C. Bagaghi's collection, uh, the Frank Netter published these things a long time ago. And you'll notice that here's the airway and the sinuses, the teeth and gums are all right here. This is the epiglottis. And it, it's commonly all put together in a very small area. So any interference in this area is going to have a change that, uh, that has to do with it. And this simply is just shows the area of cough uh, that is innervated uh, with coughing. Now, why, why would people be toxic? And here's the reason why. Uh, excuse me here. Let me get, go back. All this area is the alveolar sac, and you'll notice there's a capillary network so that every time the lung expands and contracts, you essentially have a pus pump or, a, an, or whatever it is, whatever the organism is, that's expanding and contracting right here next to this vascular network. So bacteremia in pneumonia is very, very common. And if you look at infectious disease and fatalities, the reason pneumonia has such a high fatality rate is it has a huge blood supply and it has this pump or, uh, or accordion effect that allows these air sacs to expand like an uh, accordion and, and contract, and therefore you get bacteremia much more commonly than with other illnesses. So <clears throat> what if we have bilaterality? Because we've already said that pneumonia should be a unilateral illness. This is the list for bi bilaterality, and you'll notice that most of these have a vascular origin. Heart failure pulmonary fibrosis. These are very staccato crackles that sound like the unfolding of Velcro. Pulmonary emboli in an area that's focal can cause, uh, can cause uh, bilateral disease. Massive GI aspiration. Granuloma disease. TB, uh, TB and the nature's uh, uh, histo are commonly bilateral. Uh, hematogenous pneumonia um, is a, a bad news deal, and hematogenous pneumonia means you get it in the bloodstream, and we have to remember the lung is a venous filter. Whatever goes in the lung is going to, in the bloodstream, will end up in the pulmonary vasculature, and they make microembolic uh, episodes, which is the time that we see ARDS and some of the other things that get to be a whole lot worse. Drug toxicity, especially this guy, amniodarone. I hate this drug. I don't know why the FDA ever put it on the market. Not only does it knock out the liver, it can bother the kidney, but it causes a pulmonary fibrosis type uh, process. And, and uh, we all have a, a dig uh, a, a, a aversion now, as we heard yesterday. But if I'm going to control atrial fibrillation and I cannot control it, meaning that I can't cure it, that I'm going to use uh, uh, rate control instead of rhythm control. So if this drug does not work to control the, uh, to the process, which is the rhythm control, I'd rather have digitalis to rate control at any time. Chemotherapy can, uh, in, uh, can injure the lungs. And then we get the workplace stuff, which we really don't take very good histories of what people actually do. In fact, if you talk to a lot of these industrial workers, they have no idea what they're supposed to. So you got to sort of make a phone call, talk to a foreman and say, look, I'm trying to figure this out. Maybe you can help me because we don't want other people getting this process. So these are the, our list of the bilateralities. But whenever you see bilaterality, if this is a pneumonia, you're probably in that 3 to 5 percent that actually has bacteremia, and that's bad news. So uh, what about crackles? What, what is the origin of the crackle? And I don't know about you guys, but I'm an old fella, and whenever somebody died, we actually had to go look at the slides and present it at a case conference for anybody that died for whatever reason on our service. That's the way it was. And you'd look at a slide, and here's this eosinophilic junk, and you'll see one bacteria or a couple of bacteria, but it wasn't a big wad of bacteria. And it took me a while to realize that what is really happening is that that in order to change, there's a permeability in the capillary because there's a gunfight going on at the OK Corral, and so you've got a white blood cell coming from that, that vascular network that we showed 
that is now carried by the blood supply to uh, the uh, lung and the bacteria is right in there. And then the, the white cells release these suicide packets that cause a transudation of fluid. And so if you've got somebody that's neutropenic, severely dehydrated, or has some sort of funny bacteria, it'll change the way it presents. But in order to have a crackle, you have to have permeability. And we've all had these old guys brought in from the nursing homes, and they look crummy, and their mentation is bad. And you hear, you really listen carefully, and you hear a few things. And the x-ray's got these little shadows on one side. But then, so you plug in the saline, and the next day, the radiologist calls you and goes, my God, man, you got a progressive pneumonia. This thing's getting a whole lot worse. And what you're really looking at is this is what's called rehydrational pneumonia. We've all seen it, but we don't think about what's really happening. So once we volume load somebody, it blossoms out, and it doesn't mean you need to change what you're doing. We expect that to happen. It's sort of like twisting your ankle at, at late at night, and it looks pretty good the next morning. <laughs> what do you have? You've got a sack where the ankle used to be. So this is all a matter of permeability, and it's, you would not believe it, but try to find a well-written book on pneumonia. If you understand this and, and look at these things, you're going to know more than the pulmonary doctors taking care of your patients. Why? Because we never think about it in an organized process. We have this protocol, we throw drugs at it, and guess what? Most of them get better. Well, I'm going to show you some uh, protocols that will actually help you sharpen your focus on what you're going to use. But anyway, uh, the neutropenic people are tough, and, um, and so they are going to have their changes very late. Now, what about uh, cough transmissible pneumonias? As kids, we were taught, you know, you cover your cough and don't do this, don't do that. But, it, but statistically, since 95% of the pneumonias are aspirational, cough has nothing to do with it. There are, however, cough transmissible pneumonia. So what can you get from your patient and what can we give to our patients if we happen to be sick and all of us work riding a dead horse to work? <laughs> no matter what, you show up because people are expecting you to show up. And so what are the cough transmissible pneumonias? The question you always want to ask when someone shows up with pneumonia, are other people sick around you? And when they say, yeah, the kid brought it home from school, and then my wife got it. Then. So you're getting a history of cough transmissibility, and here's the ones. Mycoplasma, TB, viral illness, whooping cough, the plague. Legionella I put in here, it's an aerosol, and it is not cough transmissible. It is aerosol transmissible. And then chlamydia. So all these things have one uh, item in common. They're small particles. They're one to five micro. And so that is sort of like going to the Yankee Stadium and trying to hit a ball out of Yankee Stadium. You probably couldn't do that, but if somebody gives you a golf ball, you're going to come a whole lot closer to hitting that thing over center field. You have the same amount of effort and momentum, but the pellet is smaller and it goes farther. So the thing that makes these things cough transmissible is they are very, very small particles. And yet, you'll never hear this in college. I didn't learn this in medical school or even in my training. I just saw a lot of people and figured it out, you know. A rare stroke of brilliance. My boss was always saying to me, well, God damn it, if I can get you to think you might amount to something, because I'm asking you millions of questions. He's laughing like crazy. But, you know, he, he got me to think about putting these things together in an organized process. So cough transmissibility limits these things to a very few issues. And obviously, the common one would be mycoplasma, which is an atypical, and chlamydia, which is an atypical, and then viral illness. Whooping cough is coming back, and it still has that characteristic inspiratory whoop, like the whooping cranes, and you can tell that. And by the way, um, it's not, the number of cases is uh, getting to be exponential in the United States. So what about Legionella? And th this is an aerosol. Haemophilus is a little tougher, and we're not seeing the Haemophilus now because the pediatricians have been vaccinating children. And so we don't see Haemophilus like we used to. It is not cough transmissible, but in a herd of children, 
it may be fomites or whatever in the daycare centers, uh, but it's not nearly as common as it used to be. So, uh, keeping these thoughts in mind, we're going to look for uh, aspiration and reflux uh, and neurological illness and other things. You can see it in neurologic disease, hiatal hernias, and then if you've got immune disorders, uh, that's something else that we have to consider. Now, what is consolidation? Consolidation is a tracheal breast sound in a non-tracheal location. So, and it's very, very uh, telling of what's going on here. So if it's lobar, the commonest cause is pneumococcal pneumonia. And, and by the way, consolidation is an uncommon finding, but when you got it, it always sounds like you're listening to the trachea when you're not. It takes, a, it takes an open airway and a solid lung in order to do that. So, uh, what are the things that happen with consolidation? You can see it with Legionella, rarely. Mycoplasma, really rarely. AIDS flu, it's just hardly ever. But pulmonary emboli is one of the things you'll hear it in because when you infarct the lung, you get this hemorrhagic area. You have then an open airway since it's a vascular process and you've got this consolidated segment, and it tends to go away. We used to see this with open heart surgery and freeze injury, and freeze injury was when they had a long case. Uh, when you look at open heart surgery, they, they hack the coconut open, the pericardium, they lay a person on one side, and they operate, and they pack the heart in ice. What runs through the pericardial sac? You ever see hiccups with pericarditis? the phrenic nerve actually runs inside the pericardial sac. And we would see these people with this phrenic nerve frozen, and they would be hypoxic and tachypnic. And we're, what the heck is this? They don't have fever, and it was a frozen uh, phrenic nerve. It takes about six weeks for this to come uh, around. And I suggested when I watched it that they make a mini pad to protect the phrenic nerve. And, and that actually, somebody then made a product and patented it, and they use that in prolonged cases of open heart surgery to prevent freeze injury from nailing the phrenic nerve, because it, it, it's a six weeks of immobility and it's the oxygen need when it should never have happened in the first place. Okay, so uh, these are the guys that, that, that we worry about. Now, let's take a look at pneumococcus. And I can tell you that pneumococcus is going to change. We're now seeing this Prevnar 13 on television, and that's a better vaccine, the conjugated vaccine for adults and for children. Um, so pneumococcal pneumonia is the commonest outpatient pneumonia. The books say that 60% of all outpatient pneumonias are pneumococcus. I'm not sure about that anymore, and, I'll, and later on I'll tell you why. These guys are sick. They have a shaking chill. They have lobar consolidation with bronchial breast sounds, usually in the right lower lobe. And occasionally, they'll have a herpetic rash, fever blisters, that there seems to be a little uh, a, a weld, if you will, between fever blisters and pneumococcus, so that you activate uh, a viral il uh, illness along the lips, which does not need to be treated. But it's very easy to make this diagnosis because when you do a gram stain, you've got these 50 caliber bullets that are gram positive, and it used to respond to most antibiotics. Now, <clears throat> the resistance uh, throughout the world varies on the location, and penicillin resistance is due to altered binding sites. So you got the Starship Enterprise, and, and the binding, and the, the, the scout ship is trying to bind to this capsule and take it out, and it doesn't happen. So uh, penicillin binding protein changes uh, it, it are part of what's going on. I think, however, f we saw episodes of this, <clears throat> and we will see uh, 10 or 15 cases a year, and then it sort of falls back and you don't see it for a while. But it's not that tough to tell. And the most effective drugs today uh, are newer quinolones, uh, tequinavilox, levoquin, and Factive. Uh, unfortunately, do not use Cipro for this illness. The Muppeteer, uh, Jim Henson, died of pneumococcal sepsis when he was on Cipro. And the reason is that 
that all these other advanced uh, drugs, advanced meaning they're newer than Cipro, have two killing sites. The, the, everybody knows the DNA gyrase, but topoisomerase 4 is the second killing site, and that's the one that works for pneumococcus. Cipro does not have that, okay? And so you got to know that don't use Cipro when pneumococcus is it because it's not nearly as effective as the newer agents. And, uh, and all these things are great because they not, only, not only do you give a blood level when you give it IV, but orally it's equally as effective. So you don't have to necessarily start an IV and, 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 and plug them like this. And this is a Waterhouse Friedrichsen, again from, uh, from fr uh, Frank Netter's stuff. And this just shows a guy who's having uh, this Waterhouse Friedrichsen syndrome, and it shows the pneumococci here. This is especially common in asplenic individuals. Okay, so anytime you got no spleen, you got to worry about that. The other thing that happens is we get multiple myeloma. A multiple myeloma, and, and they'll put you, uh, this is a board question. You got a 55 year old guy with multiple myeloma that comes in looking septic. You already know what it's going to be. It's not going to be something uncommon, it's going to be a common bug. And the reason is, that, that people f think that myeloma is like an M protein, but when you look at the protein electrophoresis, it's, a, it's in the gamma globulin spectrum. So what happens is you make this one, the, all the junkyard pieces go to making uh, the M protein, but you don't make gamma globulin. And what happens when your gamma globulin is low? And what do we do in kids that don't have spleens? It's gram positives that you worry about. Okay, so in that individual, whenever you see myeloma, treat them for an, a, an anti-pneumococcal uh, drug, asplenic, trauma, sickle cell disease, the spleen gets infarcted, very common in those unfortunate people, the low gamma globulin, and then we look at vaccinations that are really going to help. So um, the resistance due to penicillin binding protein uh, is, is interesting. A lot of people will use Augmentin versus Amoxyl. Augmentin has clavulinic acid in it, and clavulinic acid simply protects the beta-lactam ring from beta-lactamase. Well, guess what? Board question number two, um, would you rather spend $25 for uh, a 875 twice a day penicillin, uh, Amoxyl, or would you rather spend $135 and get diarrhea and use clavulinic acid with it? And the answer is there is absolutely no reason to use the more expensive drug because pneumococcus does not and has not and hopefully never will make beta-lactamase. Uh, the clavulinic acid doesn't add anything to the strength of the drug. It simply protects the drug from being destroyed by beta-lactamase. So it's not like you got two drugs in one. And then the issue uh, is, is uh, not resistance so much it's virulence. This is, a, this is a worse bug than it used to be. Uh, so rapid administration within four hours. If they ask you on the boards, you got a patient that comes in the ER, make sure the pharmacist has dosing in the ER where you get this drug in quickly. The survival rate for pneumococcus, which accounts allegedly for four, half the deaths of pneumonia in the United States, the quicker you get it, the, the quicker they get better. And blood cultures may be positive in six hours, like it is with all gram positives. And frequently we see herpes simplex as the little guy that goes along there giving us a tell. Now, uh, what about the vaccinations? Well, uh, this is from the New England Journal of Medicine this year. In fact, it's in March of this year. Um, the Dutch uh, were, they did not use the polysaccharide vaccine. The polysaccharide vaccine, uh, known as Pneumovax, does not prevent new cases of pneumonia. Uh, it does prevent bacteremia, and allegedly about 40% of the time. The Dutch, however, did not feel in their isolated population it was worth doing. So they, when the better vaccine, the Prevnar 13, came out, they decided to, to do a, a uh, study in their people, and they had 84,000 people over age 65. And then they only got one dose of this 13-valent uh, vaccine. If you look at the children's dosing, they got four doses for, of, the, of their Prevnar, four doses. And it's very much more effective. 
this was an interesting study, and they, they, in order to confirm that it was pneumococcus, there's a new urinary antigen test called Binax, and it's 75% sensitive, and it's got 18% false positive, so it's a fairly good test. The thing that was intriguing about this is that four years in the study, they only had 49 patients in the vaccinated group versus 90 patients in the placebo group. But they vaccinated eight, uh, half of 84,000 people. If I were an ID guy giving them advice, what would I tell them? Don't bother. Why on earth with this few cases would we want to do it in adults? The other question I would ask is, if you really had a problem, why would you only use one shot of a vaccine in a guy at my age, over 65, when we know oh, my immune system is not like your children's? So there's some questions about it, but basically we're, the, our guys are, wrecking, are recommending Prevnar. And uh, the other thing that was interesting, right here, community-acquired pneumonia, which there were 270 cases of in both groups, were equal. Now, if pneumococcus is the cause of 60% of the pneumonias, why was there an, an, an equal number of community-acquired pneumonias? This thing raised real questions in my mind about the epidemiology and some of the truth in which we're talking about here. But I just wanted to mess up your thought process. It's in the literature. It's two weeks old. Uh, we were waiting for this study because uh, the Dutch are very scientific about how they do things. And I liked the study. I was shocked at how few cases there were and, and how they showed this. Now, so pneumococcus, if you look at children, the Prevnar vaccine came out in, in uh, 2005, I think, or 2000. JAMA had an entire issue, and what it showed was that if they got one shot, it reduced the incidence by 90%. If they got the four-shot series, it reduced it by 97%. And guess what happened? In the immune-naive people, the people that took care of these kids, it reduced the incidence of pneumococcal pneumonia by 55%, and that's what's called herd immunity. And so we know that pneumococcus is not transmitted, but the fact that they're fooling with the kids and all, they still get exposure with fomites and stuff. And so pneumococcus, although not cough transmitted, can be group transmitted by contact. And so that was a very interesting thing. But the vaccine in adults did not turn out to be near as good mainly because A, you've got old immune systems, and B, at 150 bucks a shot, because the Dutch were not willing to do it over a series of, uh, like our children, uh, they didn't think it was going to be worthwhile. We, were going, we are going to see a definite declination of pneumococcus in our society because of the vaccination program, as was proved in Kaiser Permanente in, in California. How about that? So this is uh, mycoplasma. It's a cough transmitted illness. We've known about it for years. And, and what, it, what it really does is uh, uh, it, it causes cough way out of production. It don't produce much sputum. The chest x-rays sort of got a little mild bronchial pneumonia, if anything, uh, rarely low bar disease. When you do a sputum, you find gram nata. You don't, it doesn't, nothing stains. And that's because uh, the, this thing does not have a cell wall. And so it's cough transmitted. If you get a sputum sample, which is rare, uh, uh, you, you won't see any bugs. And people cough. I see young ladies coughing so hard they break ribs. I'll say, you know, I, you know, I got a pain over here from coughing. And when you put your hands along the ribs, you can feel them click. So a, exuberant cough. Um, they are not particularly ill, so they go to work and give it to everybody else. And uh, the history is made by... Uh, uh, some sputum, which is usually greenish, no bugs, and a lack of response to cephalosporins or penicillins. Gee, my doc gave me amoxil and I didn't get better. Why? No cell wall. And remember, those are all cell wall, uh, cell wall agents. So any sort of DNA or RNA type inhibitor will work for these, uh, these bugs. So tetracycline, macrolides, quinolones, remember, we don't use penicillins or a tetracycline redder in kids due to the teeth staining. And uh, b both DNA and RNA gyrase inhibitors will work. 
And once you get an antibody level, it doesn't protect you from the next case. So the guys who get it frequently get it. And so <laughs> what happens here is in, in uh, mycoplasma, um, the same guys get it every year. We call it kennel cough. And if you live in a place where all the young people come, the college kids, like the Rhode Island Jazz Festival, or in my, in my area, we see mycoplasma, guess what? Uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, and spring break. <laughs> That's because all the kids come. So there's a, there's a misconception that old people don't get uh, this disease. They get it commonly if they're exposed to the kids who carry it. So don't, don't, on the test, don't put down it's uncommon in old people. It is not. It's uncommon in, the, in, in unexposed people. And that's the difference because it's cough transmissible. And uh, there are some strange things that can happen with it. Let me look here. This is, maybe I've got to go back. Yeah, you can actually get a hemolytic uh, uh, anemia. You, uh, you can get bullous meningitis. Uh, with mycoplasma, it's uncommon to see that. Uh, cold gluten and positive uh, hemolysis, but there's a specific antibody, now it's a PCR, for mycoplasma. And when they cough like crazy, produce little sputum, and have asthma-like symptoms that may persist, uh, then you always want to think about mycoplasma. And it, it shows up easily <clears throat> on any of these antigen tests. What about AIDS flu? Well, that's a green phlegm bug. We see this commonly in smokers. So if you've got somebody with polypaxia, the COPD, -er, we, we pretty much know that, that the varieties of AIDS flu are going to be present. These people get to be pretty sick. And if you look at the serotypes, they sort of chronically are inhabited with, uh, with AIDS flu. But when they get sick, that serotype changes. And when, they, when you reculture them afterwards, they'll still have some AIDS flu. It doesn't mean you need to continually treat them, but it does mean that's the one you're going to look for. We also see AIDS flu and chronic recurrent sinusitis. Whenever you see green phlegm, that's probably your bug. And we see it in people that have chronic lung disease and are chronically ill. Um, and so they, it produces endotoxin, which makes people sick. And one of the reasons AIDS flu is aggravating is they can't cough up the sputum. There's a thing that calls uh, <clears throat> ciliostatin. Eli Lilly was selling one of their, uh, their cephalosporins and they had a little box they'd show you the, the cilia pumping away. And then after the AIDS flu, they sort of look like rushes that have been blown flat after a hurricane. They don't work anymore. And that makes it not clear. So when a patient starts coughing up green phlegm, they're getting better. And remember, smokers have damaged cilia anyway. And uh, probably that has something to do with why they get it. But anyway, <clears throat> it, it does produce endotoxin. You can get gram-negative sepsis. But the sinusitis is a real common one here with green phlegm. Uh, they're toxic. They cough up this stuff. And <clears throat> sometimes resistance occurs because this guy is the beta-lactamase producer. So this time, 50% of the time, they make beta-lactamase. You could try the cheap amoxyl. First, but if after three or four days they're not getting better, bring them back in and add the clavulinic acid to you know the uh, uh, <clears throat> more expensive amoxyl, and guess what? It'll it'll help them get better. So uh, bronchodilators may be needed to help clear it, um, <clears throat> and so the this 50% of amoxyl, uh, and we use the 875 twice a day, <clears throat> so the augmentin would be a better choice in this particular bug. And um, so augmentin works, uh, any of the quinolones work. Uh, quinolones work great in green phlegm. And I, have a, I like the quinolones because they have concentration-dependent killing. And because they have two uh, mechanisms of killing, resistance is not much of a problem with quinolones, especially in the chronically ill. And don't forget that quinolones also will take care of pseudomonas, which other drugs do not. And um, that's why we kind of like it in our old guys that get a lot of bad problems here. What about Klebsiella? We don't see this much anymore, but it's basically a disease of alcoholics. It tends to be in the upper lobe, usually on the right side, the posterior division, which is a real tell. And unlike the consolidation of pneumococcus, 
what happens here is there is a destructive process going on. And so the upper lobe will fold up like a fan and you will see the fissure shift on the right side, the minor fissure goes up, and you see this volume loss in the posterior division of the right upper lobe. Because many of these guys smoke and drink, we end up having to bronchoscope them and hardly we ever, we don't find much problem, but that piece of lung is gone. You do not treat uh, Calypsiella to fix that process. You, you, you treat this, them to stop the process so that the rest of the lung does not get involved. And it looks like current jelly sputum when they can produce it. But uh, the volume loss is a destructive pneumonia. They do not have E to A change. They do not have tracheal breast sounds. They're just silent in that posterior division. Uh, and so that's important. So sometimes type 2 diabetes, but here's the one. Alcohol, alcohol. Gram negative rod that looks like a wine barrel. barrel. <laughs> that's appropriate. Okay. And most cephalosporins and quinolones. Um, it probably will not respond to penicillin. And uh, this is a, 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 a netter picture. Here's the upper lobe being consolidated. And uh, um, so y you can see that uh, uh, this is posterior because the ascending arch of the aorta is still cl clearly seen from that. And uh, remember, uh, the, in the, the rule of um, pneumonia, uh, anatomically adjacent structures of equal density obscure. So if this thing were uh, anterior, you would not be able to see the, uh, the loop of the aorta as we see right here. Uh, it's posterior and is not adjacent to the aorta. And, and here's some, a shot of these little, these, uh, little abscesses and, and there will be huge volume loss and pretty soon you wouldn't recognize it. What about Legionnaire's disease? Thank goodness it's uncommon. It is not uncommon in Florida because of, of all the, the um, air conditioners. Cleaning out air conditioning ducts is where it happens. And this is the, one of the bad building bugs. You'll see uh, symptoms, and, and the chest x-ray can be a lot of things. But it's an ARDS type pattern with extensive toxicity. And cough transmission does not occur. You don't need to isolate these guys. Uh, what happens is they tend to have, uh, they're toxic as can be, 40% of the time they have diarrhea. And by the way, all atypicals, including mycoplasma, have this same, the same likelihood. So if you get diarrhea and you get uh, a cough and a guy that's really sick, blame Legionnaire's disease. Air hunger, confusion, racking cough, they have very high white counts. The liver function tests go up 40% of the time. And when you do get sputum, again, like with mycoplasma, you don't find any organisms. So <clears throat> this is an ARDS type pattern, and there's a, some really magic treatments. Um, there'll be a contaminated aerosol source. So if there's a sick building, you want to look at the air conditioning ducts. I've got an ethical dilemma. I had a, a very, uh, a very uh, charismatic lady who was a, a secretary uh, to the judges. And uh, they had just rebuilt this building and everybody kept getting sick. And so I looked at her and said, this has got to be Legionnaire's disease. So we sent the Board of Health up to the, to the segment of the uh, place where everybody was sick. And we grew Legionnaire's out of the air conditioning ducts that, that were firing it into the population. So here's the dilemma. We know people can die of Legionnaire's disease. You got all these lawyers around. What do you do? I mean, it's really one of these, you know, what do you do? I mean, I was very tempted to go, no, but Jiminy Cricket in my ear, you remember the Disney movie? No, you got to do the right thing. No, I don't want to do the right thing. Well, I did the right thing. And, um, and um, the county claimed that that was just incidental. And I said, I will see you in court. You want to debate this, you show me an expert and I'll kill him on the stand. You know, it, it is cough trans or aerosol transmissible. And, and uh, shower heads, all the things that happen uh, it can be a real problem. Now, um, one of the things that we see this is you got a guy with a high wild count, sick as can be, with some pneumonia, the sputum, and the common mistake with the high liver functions, they get confusion. They get confused with mycoplasma, and the patients will not tell you that they're hallucinating. They don't want you to think that it's a Section 8, you know, you're going to put them in the loony bed. But when you walk in, 
They don't make eye contact. They're looking for butterflies. So instead of looking at your face, they're sort of looking around the room, and you say, have you been seeing things that don't exist? <sighs> Thank God. And they will tell you then that they hallucinate. It's part of the really sick syndrome with, with this disease. And if you don't ask, you will never know that. But reassure them it's not the drugs, it's the bugs. And it will get better. And I had a, a guy that was a plasterer that had a pretty good drinking history. And the house staff asked me to see this guy. And uh, he, uh, he was hallucinating and uh, talking to somebody sitting in the chair. And I said, this is not DTs. They, they don't get tremulous and all this stuff. I said, do not treat him for DTs. This will go away on its own. So we had a bet. I think I won a case of uh, beer at that time. We always got to bet the house staff to punish them, uh, and they remember when they lose, uh, and they remember when they win, too, by the way. <laughs> so anyway, this confusion can be a real problem, and, and so the liver function test may fool you into thinking this is DTs with withdrawal. It is not. And, and what do we do? Jug of, the drug of choice, oral biaxin, IV quinolones, or oral quinolones. If they're really sick, rifampin will work and may be added, but anyway, it's rapidly progressive, and you get ARDS, and, the, and the, when you listen, you don't hear much uh, of this going on with your stethoscope, and you'll see a dramatic improvement in 48 hours, dramatic. So oral macrolides, especially by accent, and, and which has no um, FDA approval for it, but it sure as the devil works, and any sort of quinolone will work, but get it early. And I frequently combine them both when they're really sick and then drop off one when they get less sick. But they will go from near death and, uh, and, and dying to being well quite quickly. Now what about staph? Staph's a surgical illness. Uh, and what happens is we, we give antibiotics to wall this critter off. And then we know that they're probably going to get uh, big infected looking cysts and they're probably going to have a pneumothorax with this. And so sometimes you want a chest cutter. If you're not good at putting in chest tubes, hire the chest uh, doctor or a pulmonary doc that does those things, which we all do as far as I know. And anyway, you're, you're going to likely to have to have surgical drainage. And this thing's up uh, here showing um, the, the problem. Here's these big uh, bilateral asymmetrical holes in the lung, very thick walled cavity, and it tends to go right lower lobe worse than left lower lobe because of the distribution. That's because it's a bacteremic pneumonia. And the bacteremia will put it in the lower lobes greater than the upper lobes. And, and here's the, the, the pocket starting to form with a little pneumothorax on one side. And so <clears throat> they're extremely toxic. They have high white counts. Uh, often it's post-influenza. Once you do a gram stain, you see these, these uh, huge grape-like uh, gram-positive cocci, tachypnea and dyspnea. And because it's hematogenous, it's going to be bilateral. And remember, that's the bacteremic pneumonia we talked about in that list. And you've got to get it with any sort of uh, <clears throat> penicillin that works. And, and obviously, the drug's going to be stafcillin, methicillin. Uh, it can cause ARDS. And one of the questions that you may be asked in, on the ID part of your boards is um, what gram positives cause ARDS? And we know that, that pneumococcus can do that because it has a capsulated uh, 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 structure. Staph can do it, and we see it with yeast sometimes that can cause a, a activation, the indirect activation to complement, and that gets us into the wet lung cascade. Uh, vancomycin is not, repeat, not a good drug for methicillin sensitive staph. In the studies done uh, out of uh, St. Louis, there was a 50% fatality rate when vancomycin was used. When you look at dicloxacillin or, or uh, and added with genomycin, even primaxin, uh, especially the diclox, uh, the, the, there was no fatalities. Okay, But you do have a surgical consequence because um, these guys are going to need chest tubes to drain the empyema. And many times they have to be decorticated. The word now is put the chest tubes in, find a good chest cutter that you don't like who's so aggressive you don't even want to play golf with him, and don't, don't get a wimp surgeon on this case, okay, or a wimp pulmonary doctor. They're going to have to be decorticated, getting this 
pyogenic membrane off, usually within a week. And so you do one side, wait a week, and do the other side, not the six weeks delay like we were told when I trained 50 years ago. So <clears throat> first generation cephalosporins are just as good. And here's one, if you're around the military or in colleges, uh, the guys get in bar fights. I, my knuckles still show the scars when I was defending my boys in Texas, uh, not so nice, uh, never did get it all healed. But what does a guy do when he's got busted knuckles? You guys know what you do. You pump your fingers. Pump your fingers. What, what is that doing? That eschar is allowing that pressure to build up and back to remake your body. So whenever you get a guy with a boxer fracture or busted up knuckles, put them in a splint and tell them, don't take this off for five days when you come back to see me. Because when you, when you get a, a knuckle buster, it's usually staph that you got in, in the hands. Put them on an anti-staphylococcal cephalosporin and see them back, and this will prevent them from pumping their knuckles. It sounds stupid, but I've seen a number of guys with this, and that's how they got it. And believe me, um, it, um, it's, it's a process that you can prevent because it's not, this is a six weeks illness, okay? If you can sign off and dump it on the pulmonary doc, all the better. Got to make the specialists pay for their education. So anyway, this, sometimes you will get a back pain. Anytime you see somebody with fever, a high white count, and excruciating back pain, you got a neurosurgical em uh, emergency. Okay, quickly get some x-rays and get a neurosurgeon in there because uh, it, what you're really seeing is pressure over the spinal cord, uh, either a, a, a um, osteo of the back, uh, because remember, it's hematogenous, and where does the blood supply go? Red marrow, high, high blood supply, and that's how it gets there. And so, when well, they got pleurisy, get a chest tube out and put it at the bedside. Of all the ones I've seen, which is a number, I've only had one that de did not develop a pneumothorax uh, with staph. And so you get a big board chest tube, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I'd say one to two weeks, they get a decortication. And they're doing thoracoscopy now. Okay, so anyway, with the hematogenous illness, guess what happens? Where does 20% of the blood supply go? The kidney. So psoas and perinephric abscesses are also common. I always get a urine on these guys to look for the presence of embolic staph in the urine. And so how do you handle that? You let the CT guys put a catheter in there. We don't operate on them anymore. We just drain them tr transcutaneously. Our invasive radiologists have saved poor guys like me a lot of work. <laughs> they used to do all this stuff. And so um, <clears throat> they're drained radiologically, but staph is something you do not want to have. And, <clears throat> you know, it's, and here's one about M MRSA. Whereas uh, MSSA is very aggressive, MRSA is sort of a slow dog. It doesn't really tear you up. And this is very different. So. Uh, it, it's usually lobar and unilateral, interestingly enough. It's commonly seen with IV drug use in which it might be bilateral. Uh, it's very unlikely to see bacteremia. And so the, the bad guy is, is USA 100 versus 300. This guy's a lot more aggressive and a number of it's rising. And occasionally this PVL, this, uh, this Panton leukotene, uh, or valentine leukocidin makes it more virulence, and the treatment is now this is vancomycin. You can use lenizolid if they're hospitalized. By the way, a bunch of drugs work for MRSA, and uh, this thing does not need chest tubes. It will get better on its own. It almost never needs surgical drainage. They're just not nearly as sick when they've got MRSA, and it tends to be low bar, which means it's not as hematogenous by any means, and the lenizolin causes bankruptcy and diarrhea, okay? <clears throat> so we, we try to use vanc principally, but a lot of oral drugs will work. And we know everything from Bactrim to you name it, to clindamycin. There's a huge number of drugs that work. You may find some resistance in your, in your uh, labs to publish all the drugs that work because the FDA has not approved all these drugs. So I got in a fight with the HCA guy and called the chief of the, of the company and said, look, what you do is you give the, us clinicians who would like to use cheaper drugs, you give us all the drugs on an antibiogram and you asterisk the drugs that are approved by the FDA. 
that gets you off the hook and it puts us on the hook, but it also gives us about 10 drugs that work to treat this because it tends to be a little bit of a recurring problem, as we know, and sometimes it's hard to get rid of. But as a pneumonia, it's not near as bad as its ugly cousin, and, and the PVL stuff is not really common in low bar disease, but it can happen. So um, <clears throat> now there's a lot more outpatient stuff, including locker rooms. Uh, it's fomite transmissible with infected sources. And when you really give a good scrub down, um, and they're pressure washing some of these uh, locker rooms uh, and using bleach, hand washing is very important in that transmissibility. Now what about chlamydia? Well, chlamydia was only known since 1986. So if you were educated after that time, you'd never heard of it. It was called TWAR, T-W-A-R. And that's for the first two cultures labeled T-W and A-R. That's why they called it TWAR. But it, what it really is, it's an atypical pneumonia that is very cough transmissible, bilateral disease, and severe sore throat is one of the tells. We see this commonly in the college guys. If they tell you my throat feels like razor blades are in there and you don't see any razor blades or any herpes, okay, then you got to bet with a racking cough um, that this is, this is likely to be chlamydia. So the patients often wait to seek care. Uh, every four days they get sick again. Finally, they come in. And if you look at age uh, and, and infectivity, if you've got <clears throat> age 20, 38% exposed to the cough because it's cough transmissible will get it. If you look at my age 60 and over, almost 70% will get it. And yet most of us have antibodies. Sinusitis, 36% of the time. Bowel pneumonia, 6%. Uh, and mycoplasma does not have sinusitis associated with it. That's another tell when you got a racking cough and cough transmissibility. Now, could you have sinusitis from another reason, yeah. So uh, the presence of sinusitis doesn't rule out mycoplasma. It means that it's not the source, okay? Because you could have somebody having chronic disease and then get something else. Uh, but anyway, um, these are tells that will help you, help you get it uh, fixed up and identified correctly. And so um, the serology, um, Ig, now this is backwards. I am acute is the way you remember this. I guess we'll have to fix that, Polly. Uh, my slide producer here occasionally has a glitch. I love her because she has the technology I do not have. I got the knowledge I do not have the technology. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a nerd when it comes to that. Uh, okay, so, uh, so, but anyway, the IgM, you can remember that, and no matter what it is, I am acute helps you to recall what that really means. And so the life cycle is they get elementary bodies. We heard about some of this from um, uh, Dr. Martin yesterday, <clears throat> the elementary bodies, reticulate bodies, and then the cryptic bodies can lie in wait for quite a long period of time. And so this has a very interesting life cycle, and we're now looking at chronic diseases that we can't really fix very well. Rheumatoid arthritis, uh, uh, asthma that is unresponsive and does not want to get better. We see it in the, in, the, in the brain samples in people with multiple sclerosis in the plaques. So we're beginning to wonder if some of these things that we just don't do well with are the chronic results of diseases like chlamydia. And so what happens is the host cell is infected. Uh, the endocytosis brings them in. You got these reticulate bodies that, that, uh, that can happen. And then you get uh, <clears throat> the cryptic bodies that will start to uh, form the reticulate bodies that there's replication. They condense to form uh, elementary bodies, which then goes back in and attacks the cell, and it ruptures, and then these things go out. And this is a four-day cycle. So people think they're getting better, but they've usually been through a couple cycles when you see them. And remember, rip roar and sore throat is also... The, the tell here for chlamydophilia. So, <clears throat> and, and, and this thing can persist, and we, we're getting to wonder about some of these diseases that we don't do well with. Now, <clears throat> and this is all the things that can happen, including cardiac atheromatous. There was a study done when there was a high level 
of IgM and IgG antibodies where they used Tequin and they showed that it didn't make any difference in the heart attacks. You know, well, that's interesting, but Teclin doesn't kill this bug. So somebody gave him bad advice. Believe it or not, this is hard to kill. And Ketec, which is the black box drug that killed livers and, you know, uh, was another uh, different form of macrolide, that's the drug that really works for this process, but it's hard to get. And the, the things that do work, uh, uh, and it, it's an unusual combination, uh, is rifampin and flagell, something we would never use. But if you want to kill chlamydia, if I were doing a study on highly positive people with plaque showing this, uh, I would use rifampin and flagell in the study to show that the half that got treated had fewer progressive plaques than myocardial infarctions. I don't know why they did that study, but it's buffoonery. I mean, even a guy like me who's not an ID guy knows better than that. So uh, rifampin and flagell will work, and it works pretty quickly. And then we got tuberculosis. And we forget about this, but they can produce all sorts of sputum. We know it's cough transmissible. Upper lobe cavities, usually in the posterior division of either upper lobe. Um, it causes cavitary disease. You notice the pulmonary arteries are pulled up here. Whenever you see a pulmonary artery branching out, it's called a hanging angel sign. In other words, the pul as the upper lobes retract, the volumes, re the shift to replace the, the bottom of the lung expands. And these pulmonary arteries are pulled out. It's called a hanging angel sign because in the old days when we didn't have good treatment, they all went to heaven. We hope they went to heaven, uh, Dr. Ronnie. <laughs> but anyway, don't forget about tuberculosis. Now, I want to show you something real quickly when I, when I quit here. Concentration-dependent killing. What this means is that if you, the higher a dose you give, the better the whack. And concentration-dependent killing is only seen in a couple drugs. Fluoroquinolones, that means all of them, and aminoglycosides. And so if you got somebody desperately sick, you get a quicker response due to these drugs, which are time-dependent killing. That means you get an area above the MIC, and the longer you take it, the better you get. But it has a longer time axis. And I'll tell you a story. When, uh, um, when um, I was at Southern Medical as a moderator for infectious disease, I was, we were talking about bacteremic pneumococcus. And I asked these guys, what do you use? And they said, well, we use, uh, you know, uh, cephalosporin and, and, uh, and uh, Zithromax. And how do you know that pneumococcal pneumonia is, is bacteremic? because you get crackles on the other side. So if you've got consolidation on one side and crackles on the other, how do you think those crackles got there? Bacteremia. And so I asked these guys, why are you using time-dependent killing when, when time is not on your side? Why, why don't you use a quinolone and an aminoglycoside? And you know what they said? These are experts. We never thought of it. Now remember this, we're all intelligent people and we all have our biases, and, but I'll tell you one thing, when you make a decision that gives somebody a better outcome, we will all march to the beat of your drum. Why? Because you got it right and we should have got it right. And I didn't mean to embarrass these guys, but they, they were dumb fat. They all came back to me and said, holy Christ, we never thought of this. Well, you know, you want to have concentration-dependent killing because this thing really whacks them. And this is a slide uh, uh, from um, Gleason, I guess. And what it really shows is that the area under the curve, the higher you, you, you go, the quicker they die. And so you always want a real concentration-dependent killing. Now, this is a Medicare study done by Gleason. This was in the Archives of Internal Medicine in, uh, in uh, November of 99. And what he did was a Medicare-funded study where they had 12,000 Medicare inpatients, guys sick enough to be in the joint. And what they found was that uh, they, they were treating them with a various amount of regimens. And here's what the numbers showed. If you had um, a fluoroquinolone alone, um, the hazard reduction was the very best, okay? And then if you use a second generation Ceph plus a macrolide, and this is where the Recephin the Recephin uh, Zithromax came in. This was the study that actually brought it in. 
Uh, so there was a risk reduction, not as good as fluoroquinolones, but pretty darn good. And, and so <clears throat> if you got ahead a person that was treated with a pseudomonal uh, third generation or a, uh, a macrolide, uh, things didn't turn out to be too good. This was a 30-day mortality study. And so uh, the more uh, you needed aminoglycoside, you can start seeing that there's more people dying. And a beta-lactamase inhibitor, which would mean you're going to use uh, something that like uh, uh, trivalenic acid or ticarcillin with uh, uh, <clears throat> a uh, beta-lactamase inhibitor and a macrolide, there was a lot higher deaths. It was funded by the HRS and not by a drug company. And here's the study that, this, that came from Gleason. And here's the lowest death rate, which is a fluoroquinolone. And then you got rocephin and Zithromax. And then it, it, the death rate goes up as we go away from this combination. So <clears throat> let's take a look now at a Dutch study that was published just two months ago. And oh, oh, I'm sorry. So, uh, it's a, yeah, OK. What, what this showed is the same thing, that the Dutch study uh, th they didn't find that, that the dual therapy made much difference, but they only had 650 patients. The first one was 12,000. So they said that they found that if you used an antibiotic alone like a penicillin, they did just as well. However, let's see if I got it. Here you go. Let me go back one. What they showed right here is that this was all non-ICU, and, and what they found was that the very best result were fluoroquinolones for a 90-day mortality study. So what we're saying is that either oral or IV fluoroquinolones in both studies turned out to be the most survivable for elderly, which is what we see with get these bad things. And with that.